She is a Fox News contributor. She is also the author of a brand new book, Love Mom, Inspiring Stories Celebrating Motherhood. Just here we are three days before Mother's Day. She is Dr. Nicole Sapphire. Hey, doctor. How are you today? Great, Will. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to have you on. I have a lot of things that I normally talk to you about off camera that I'm going to use this opportunity to explore all of my curiosity that I think is shared by my audience and talk to you about Ozempic and nicotine and steroids and HGH. But I'm going to talk to you first about this book. What made you want to write this book about motherhood? I'm going to go back, actually, to the last topic, because I'm from Arizona, and I remember when the Phoenix Coyotes actually became, and I'm a little upset that they're moving and changing the name. I think they need to keep the Coyote name, so I just needed to weigh in on that, because I'm a native Arizonan. Well, but now, I will say, I think that was a great name, by the way. <laughs> it was great. Really it's quick, perfect. before you go to the book, Phoenix Coyotes is a great name. Like coyotes is a, it's a, that was a great choice. The problem for you guys in Arizona is, I guess, it just wasn't supported in the way they needed for Arizona. So now they're about to become the Utah Mammoths. Well, I did not realize hockey was such a big deal until I moved to the East Coast. Let me tell you, it has not taken foot in Arizona. That's unfortunate. Um, and coyotes was a great <laughs> name because we had coyotes in our yard every single day. So it made sense. So now that I'm in the East Coast, Fox News medical contributor, and I was asked to write about my non-traditional motherhood journey. And it was such, um, you know, it was, I have been eternally grateful that I was able to share my own story. You know, I usually talk about and write about healthcare policy and ways to be healthier physically and mentally. So the fact that I have been able to kind of share my journey, um, for those that don't know, I got pregnant when I was still in high school. It was obviously a very pivotal moment in my life. Um, but for me, um, when I made the decision to have my child, to be that pregnant teenager walking around the halls of high school, you know, it didn't define me. It just was another moment in my life. And it helped carve who I am today. And that's kind of the message I wanted to get out in this book is, you know, when something unplanned happens or an obstacle comes in your way, it shouldn't stop you from what you're wanting to do with your life. Really, you, you can uh, you can create a path around it and still do whatever it is you want to do. And that's why this putting this book together was incredibly important. It's really inspirational for people going through a hard time, for people who, you know, want who maybe aren't feeling like, you know, they're doing everything perfect. You know, I think that reading not only my story, but so many of the other stories in the book kind of helps people realize that we're all on this journey together. Uh I love that you've decided to share your story. You shared it with me a few, I'd say, months ago now. Um, I think you shared it with me during a commercial break when you were guest hosting for Rachel Campos Duffy, uh, which I, I did not know about your story. And here's what's – so, you know, you, you're so put together. You, you know, you're so smart. Um, you're so accomplished. And I think motherhood – look, I'm going to get more into this with you in just a moment, but I think motherhood is the most important job in any in any – successful functioning society but um so it's also a blessing i mean like it's it's a spiritual blessing to both individuals or to more than just the mother and the child to the father as well it, it should be and it is that being said like teen pregnancy statistically as well i know you well know um we, we've shown it's a huge um hurdle as you described it like as, at a minimum I, I mean sometimes i think the word hurdle could actually even soften what it does statistically in society like you know i think it is you know having children out of wedlock is like one of the biggest correlating factors to rates of poverty and you know we tell our kids you know hey don't do this because it could ruin your life that's what we tell them you know because i don't know it inter in interferes with career goals but not just that college goals you automatically become somebody with way more responsibility than doing what you need to perfect or improve yourself. All of this is introduced. So because of that backdrop, Dr. Sapphire, because all those stats are true, I think your story becomes even more impactful because you overcame all of those stats. Well, you know, and there's a lot to unpack there, Will. So first of all, when you look at, you know, people who have children out of wedlock and, you know, there is a high rate of failure and when it comes to poverty and education, everything that you just described. And 
don't get me wrong, by no stretch of the imagination would I recommend to anyone, including my own three children, having a child while you're still in high school or not married, because it is it is more than a hurdle. It is a challenge and it is it is scary. But one thing that I see right now is there's a lot more support for those who are choosing the option other than choosing life. So if they find themselves with an unplanned pregnancy, maybe not married, maybe not having the financial support, there's a lot more external support to go and have an abortion or to go and give up the baby than for the person who actually wants to choose life. And so, well, again, I don't promote anybody to go out there and have these quote unquote unplanned pregnancies. I just wish that we had a, a much financial and emotional support for those who want to choose life as we do for the other choices. For me, choosing life was the right thing for me. I can't say that it is for everyone else, but this was my, this is my story. This is my journey. And I'm very grateful that I was able to lean on my faith, my family, a couple of friends, to be honest, most of my friends left me at the time. But by leaning on those around me, I was able to continue on. It was a very different journey. Uh, I was originally planned to go to the East Coast for college. I had you know, other ideas of what I wanted to do and and while I still got to my ultimate professional goals, you know, my journey was just a little bit different, certainly more challenging, um, but I got there. And so what I want people to take home from all of this is if you find yourself in one of these situations, you have to lean on those around you and you have to know that your life isn't over. You're going to work harder and you're going to spend the next few decades proving to everybody else wrong who's saying you can't do it, but you can get there. You just have to believe in yourself and lean mm -hmm. on those around you. So, and by the way, I didn't mean to um, set all that up as some type of choice between life and, and abortion. It's usually the argument we have with our kids, not argument, but like the lesson we try to teach them for abstinence, right? Don't, don't do this because here are the potential ramifications. But, you know, in your case, what I think is fascinating is, okay, but now it's happened. And what you talked a lot you took, first of all, I know you a little bit. And so the idea that you would take this on as a challenge and be like, I'm going to prove people wrong is no surprise. Um, I th and so I almost don't think there's a lesson to be learned there because I think that's, in my estimation, probably part of your personality. <laughs> like you, you just were going to be that person regardless of what the challenge was. But you still said some things that I think they're interesting because I like to look for, well, what can other people learn from this? And the, you, you talked a lot about the support. So what happened for you? Was it family was there for you at that time you changed you went to school locally like what were literally like functionally what were the things that happened in your life that made this doable well my entire senior year of high school i was pregnant uh, most of my friends uh, stopped talking to me i had to quit the cheerleading squad um and you know it was a very lonely time i had my parents were there for me and I had my teen Bible, which I kept by the side of my bed, and I still have it to this day, full of highlighting and little tabs, and it was there for a good reference. So I would go to school, I would go to work, and I would just be at home. It was a very isolating and lonely time, um, but I had the baby, and he was born six weeks before I graduated high school. He actually came to my high school graduation. My mom was holding him, the newborn up in the stands, um, kind of showing for the world to see. And that was May. And then in August, I started college. I started locally at Arizona State University because I needed to be near my family. It didn't make sense that I was going to be able to fly somewhere and be a single mom with a newborn and go to college. And so while I worked 30, you know, 30 hours a week to help support myself, I had the baby and I had my parents and my siblings. And that is really who stepped up to help me. We didn't have a lot of external support outside of that. Uh, my parents weren't necessarily high income earners, so I had to work as well. And we all band together and these were my people. And when it came to going to medical school, you know, my I talk about this a lot in the book. Um, you know, I didn't get straight A's during college. Uh, to be honest, I'm amazed I survived sometimes. It was a really tough time. I was breastfeeding. Um, I was working, I was having a baby, and I even forgot to show up to one of my exams one day. And it was devastating. Um, Oh, wow. it, was, it was it was wow, hard. we have that dream that nightmare you you lived that nightmare yeah and i go into the the dirty details of it in the chapter a little bit and ultimately the medical schools i wanted to go to you know i wasn't that i wasn't that amazing of an applicant i was average i was an average applicant i think i did great for the situation i was in 
Um, but I took a non-traditional route, and rather than going to the osteopathic schools that I was accepted to, I decided to go internationally to get the MD um, because the MD just meant so much to me. And so again, it was all, and I had to leave my son and I had to be apart from my family for a little bit. And there was just so many emotions with it, but ultimately I knew that, you know, you have to see long-term. And so in the short term, there were some major sacrifices that we made as a family that I made, um, individually, but at the end of the road, it was all worth it. And people like to say that I'm privileged and the only way that I was able to do this is because of this privilege that I have been given. And the reality is I am privileged and I am living a privileged life and I work damn hard for that privilege. Yeah. And you have the privilege. I mean, I don't care what we call it, if it's privilege or not a family like that. was That sounds like that was just integral to making it all, making it all work. Speaking of family. So the book is, um, <laughs> is in time for Mother's Day. You can check it out. It's Love Mom, Inspiring Stories Celebrating Motherhood. And you talk to a bunch of Fox News moms. Uh, Nicole, I mean, I know my co-host Rachel Campos Duffy, who has nine kids, is part of that. <laughs> so, you know, um, I think one of the themes, and like even your own life shows, there's not a formula. There's not one way to do it. And I'm sure that's what you took away from um, talking to all these different moms. I'm sure they all did it different ways, right? And But I'm curious... Did you find a commonality? Like talking to all these moms, was there something that was shared by everyone? Yeah, so we have a lot of Fox News moms in there, Rachel Campbell's Duffy's. We actually have Jennifer Hegseth, Pete's wife, uh, Martha McCallum, Ainsley Earhart, Janice Dean, but also some non-Fox people that you've never heard of. One's a patient of mine who I gave a cancer diagnosis to when she had three young kids at home. One's a Gold Star mom uh, who lost her son tragically after he came home from Afghanistan. And so... Each individual chapter is very different, but they all kind of come together with some very, some very strong themes. One of them is faith, and it doesn't necessarily mean a traditional faith, but we all kind of had faith that we were being led by something greater than us. And by leaning in on that faith and trusting that there was a bigger plan for us, that does help us through some of those dark times. Also overcoming obstacles, overcoming challenges, but really recognizing that you can't do it alone and there's no way to be a perfect mom. But as I quote in the book, there's a million ways to be a good one. And while we're kind of so busy with mom guilt and all these other things, at the end of the day, we're all doing great. And if you just read these stories, you realize we all have the same struggles. It's not like what you see on social media. Life is not picture perfect. There's no such thing as perfection. And if you're not taking care of yourself while you're also taking care of your family, you're not going to be any good for anybody. So self-care, lean in on your family, lean on your faith. Everything else is just noise. I mean, those are kind of pivotal message. One more thing on this that I want to explore with you. So I said it several times, and I didn't say it as sort of like a touchy-feely cliche, the most important job in culture or the most important job in a functioning society, motherhood. I say it because I mean it, and here's what I mean. Um, I think one of the most damaging things about modern feminism has been essentially the degradation of motherhood as a job. Now— um, what I mean by that is I think it's fine for women to choose whatever is their path in life, right? You, you're an accomplished doctor. There are several women who are high-level executives at Fox, right? But I, what, I'm no, what I am talking about is noticing that if you're not those things, right, if you're not Dr. Nicole Sapphire, if you're not Suzanne Scott— that somehow you didn't do it. Like this idea that being a mother wasn't accomplishment, raising kids isn't an accomplishment in and of itself. And I think that that was kind of part of the feminist movement. Well, the way to be accomplished or successful is to do what the men have been doing and accomplish in that field. And I think it's a real problem in that, uh, I just, I mean it. Like, I don't think there's a more important job than raising successful people. Like that's, like... I don't know what each of us gets to contribute to this world, Dr. Sapphire. I don't know how many people I get to help or touch or persuade or influence in my job. I don't know. But I know that my wife has much more influence on two than I do, the two that live in my house, right? And I have influence, but I'm saying she has the biggest job in that house. 
And she's impacting two people in a positive direction to be the next successful or positive members of America. And I just don't like this idea that that isn't like hugely noble. Like that isn't, forget the word job. That is a life well spent. Like I don't think there's any way, a more important way to spend a life than ensuring one, two, four, nine, whatever it is, next people are good people. And that's mainly, mainly, not exclusively, but mainly the job of a mom. Well, actually, I mentioned that. I think it's in the introduction of the book. I say we have, as mothers, the most important role that there ever is. It's to create and raise the next generation. I mean, the future of this world is actually in our hands. And that's another thing that a lot of the moms talk about. Yeah, we work really hard um, for our professional goals. You see a lot of people spend time and activity on their social stuff. But at the end of the day, it's raising these children, knowing that we are helping to influence the human beings that they're going to be. And in the future world, I mean, that there's nothing greater than that. And I completely agree with you that not only being a mother, being a woman is being stripped away from us as though it's insignificant. And it you can't. You, we are created specifically to create new babies and raise them. I mean, physically and mentally, that is how we're programmed. And so to try and take that away from us is probably the most devastating thing I've seen. Yeah. Uh, well, again, it's Love Mom, uh, inspiring stories celebrating motherhood. Now, I want to do this, if you wouldn't mind, for just a little bit, Dr. Sapphire. I want to just indulge a few of my own personal curiosities. Um, let's start, if you wouldn't mind. We'll start with men. Okay, so first of all, you said this to me like two weekends ago. You kind of said it in passing, and then we didn't talk about it. You said menopause is real. So like men, I don't know what age we're talking, late 40s, early 50s, mid 50s, go through what? What women go through in menopause, menopause? Well, so Rachel and I were doing our regular Sunday wellness segment, and we're talking all things menopause, you know, for women. But I'm like, hey, by the way, let's not forget men to have go through some changes, too. And I'll refer to it as menopause. And it's true. I mean, well, maybe you're not of age yet. You're still a, a young guy. But men do start having lower levels of their sex hormones, specifically testosterone, as they age, which is why it's harder for them to build muscle mass. Um, and some other things, I'm not sure where we're at with the, the rating and the age appropriateness of this podcast, but there are some other changes that happen to Let men it as fly. they get older. <laughs> you know, some of the sexual changes and the desires and the sleeping habits and kind of all those things, they do change. And a lot of it is attributed to decreasing testosterone as you age, which is why if you take external or you take testosterone supplements, especially people who are trying to build weight or put on muscle mass, you know, they're able to put on more muscle mass. Okay, well, that's a perfect um, transition into another thing I wanted to explore. So I, I find myself becoming a little more, and I, I actually share this in common with Rachel Campos Stuffy. I, I find myself becoming more, I don't know what the word would be, not homeopath, but like natural um, as I get older, uh, oh, and I'm super suspect you, of and things. I, Rachel and I are on a constant texting thread. She's like, is this safe? Is this safe? Is this safe? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think, uh, like, okay, going through menopause is natural. Going through menopause is natural. It's what's supposed to happen. So I'm just kind of curious on your thoughts. Like, I, I mean, I actually don't know that I know. I know, yeah, I know some guys anecdotally who are doing, it's called, um, what is it? What do you call it? Where they do testosterone? They, they're doing testosterone to boost those levels, like you talk about. Um, it, what are your thoughts on that? Like, for a is that just steroids made 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 popular? Um, and, and B, like, I don't know. If I did that, aren't I pushing back on what my body kind of wants and needs to be doing anyway? So the nouveau trend is for everyone to kind of be, get their hormones tested because, oh, if you're tired or you're feeling sluggish or you're having a more difficult time losing weight, it's probably your hormones. So take this medication, it'll be easier. I mean, that really just goes along to the whole instant gratification that we as Americans just we live on. My book, Make America Healthy Again, is all about that. You know, we don't necessarily want to put in the hard work. We want 
I'm tired. I don't want to focus on sleeping more and eating healthier and exercising more. I want you to tell me my hormones are off. You give me a supplement and then I feel better. And that just is kind of the American way. Do I think that maybe we're over utilizing some of these supplements? Absolutely. I think it is natural that we, we change as we age. You know, as someone who tells people they have cancer every single day, I say to my kids, I say to my friends, growing older is a privilege. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not going to get my hair done and try and present myself as the best, but we have to remember that. And we have to know that there are all different seasons of life and things change. Um, I personally am a huge supporter of like nutraceuticals, natural um, remedies. When I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, I was looking for anything I possibly can to naturally decrease systemic inflammation. You don't even know about this yet, but I actually have a line of nutraceuticals that I just don't publicly announce, but they're out there um, because of this very reason. And one actually is for men and women who, as they've gotten older, have kind of some of these decreased hormones. Maybe they're not having the same sexual drive or performance issues, um, you know, when they were able to have when they were younger. And by taking a lot of these natural substances, as long as they're pure and clean, no preservatives, I think that's the best way to go. Going and taking all of these intrinsic stuff, they comes with risk as well. For women, your hormone replacement therapies, their increased risk of endometrial cancer, breast cancer, other things. Men, testosterone, increased risk of cardiac disease, atrial fibrillation, and some other things. So, you know, it's all benefits and risk. And, you know, we have to kind of get away from that. I want a quick fix for everything. Well, the other one I want to ask you about on that on that same level of benefits and risks. So um, when I first joined ESPN, one of the first stories I worked for Outside the Lines, which is investigative journalism, long form stories and pieces. And one of the first ones I did, um, well, it doesn't matter on what this what story this was related to. It was about a swimmer, but it, completely independent of that, I was interviewing this um I think it was a doctor in, in Florida. And he said this to me just in passing. He said, if you walk down the beach in, on, in South Beach, 90% um, of the guys there are on HGH. Just for vanity, not professional athletes. Just, just for vanity. So human growth hormone. And I've heard others um, say it's a wonder drug. Like it's the fountain of youth. But it does, I mean, it, it's clearly got... It's problems, right? So from what I understand, the problem of HGH is it grows everything. It's regenerative drug, and it will also grow cancer inside your body. Not, not from scratch, not from nothing, but if you have any small semblance of it, it makes it, it, it metastasizes it. It makes it a problem, real. It makes it cancer. So HGH... And not even just HGH. I mean, honestly, people were taking metformin, which is another diabetic medication. I mean, people are taking medications looking for this fountain of youth. And ultimately, what they're trying to do is decrease overall systemic inflammation and trying to get to more youthful hormone balance that, you know, we had decades earlier. Um, and you're absolutely right. People who are on HGH and some of these other medications, they have a boost of energy. They are able to sleep better. Their skin feels better. You know, and they're building, when they're exercising, they're seeing weight come off and they're also building muscle easier. There are also these great benefits to it. But as you're mentioning, there with benefits, there's always some risk. And when it comes to HGH, HGH specifically and liver cancers, as well as other cancers, it can certainly cause them to be more aggressive. And we are all predisposed to developing cancers. I mean, cancer incidence is on the rise in us and it's just getting younger and younger. And the, because the last thing we wanna do is make it even more aggressive. So something that may be indolent, if you are then taking HGH or some of these other um, accelerants can just make it much more aggressive and could potentially end someone's life. It's interesting you say that they're all we're, all, we're trying to do the same thing with all of these, HGH, hormone replacement therapy, testosterone. We're trying to reduce inflammation. Inflammation's the enemy of youthfulness, I guess. Inflammation. I, you know, I know that anecdotally because I, you know, I try to like know how to be healthy and more vain, <laughs> you know, so I, I know that like I I inflammation is the thing. So I, even diet wise, like I'm the Tom, the TB12 method, Tom Brady, like let's <laughs> reduce inflammation. Is that my goal? Is that what I need to be doing, Dr. Sapphire? Just reducing inflammation any way possible? Not any way possible. The most natural way possible? 
<laughs> yeah, well, of course it is. The TB12 diet that Tom Brady follows, I mean, that's intense. And unless you're a mega billionaire, or mega millionaire like he is, it's hard to do if you don't have a personal chef making you all of these organic meals that I think like 70% plant-based or 80% plant-based, 20% uh, animal product. I mean, it's really difficult to follow, but ultimately our goal to not only decrease, you know, fatigue, but if we want to decrease chronic illness in general, including autoimmune diseases and cancers, it's really just lowering that systemic inflammation. We as a society, we are unfortunately introduced to way too many things right now that just has our bodies going crazy. This is why we have more cancer. This is why we have more autoimmune diseases. Think of all the preservatives and the hormones and other things that are in all of the, the foods that, and drinks that we consume right now. I mean, really, it, we're doing it to ourselves. So I personally love turmeric and ginger, and I add that to just about everything, whether it's my tea, whether it's my salad. Um, you know, anything naturally to decrease inflammation. I think there are some great medications out there for people who are really struggling. Um, but ultimately, I think the majority of people who are taking a lot of these medications don't need it. And really, they can just focus on lifestyle changes. Um, and that would do the trick. All right, two more. Ozempic. Now, here's the thing. Just like that doctor said, 90% of guys on South Beach are on HGH. I do walk around wondering, and I don't care. I don't think I care. Well, that's the point. Should I care? Like, I don't know how many people are on Ozempic now, male and female. It feels like 50%, Dr. Sapphire. And because people are losing weight everywhere I look, and I don't think everybody's getting more disciplined. So, <laughs> I mean, um, what, what do we, what do we, I, I had a friend who's a doctor who said, hey, look, Ozempic's been around a long time. They've been doing it for a couple of decades for diabetes. It's pretty well tested on its safety. That was a friend who's a doctor. But then there's just like this little, you know, intuition inside going, I don't know. Miracle drugs tend not to be miracles. So I am going to respectfully disagree with your friend. Um, GLP-1 agonists, like, let's be clear. That's what we're talking about. It's a big umbrella of medications, not just Ozempic. Ozempic is the lower dose version that was developed to treat diabetes. The Wagovi and the other medications that people are actually taking for weight loss is a much higher dose, which there is no long-term data on whatsoever. Um, we don't also have a lot of long-term data on the rapid weight loss of not just your fat, but one or what's the other thing you see of people who are on these medications, rapid muscle loss as well. What we do know from these medications are people on them in rat studies and other rodent studies, you have increased metabolic, some disorders, as well as thyroid cancers. Um, what else can happen? Well, people are reporting hair loss and pancreatitis and some other issues that are not so insignificant. So while I do see a lot of people are probably hmm. on this, and again, we have an obesity problem here in the United States. I'm all for people losing weight, but again, we're kind of doing it the American way. We're like, just give me, just give me the shot. I can't do it. I can't get to the gym. I'm too busy. I just want the shot. Um, I think that these medications really should be reserved for people who have obesity, who have metabolic or um, medical conditions that are putting them at increased risk that they will certainly benefit from these medications. But people who are just using it for routine weight loss that are not necessarily at an increased risk for any of these health problems, I'm not sure that the risks outweigh potential benefits there. Yeah, that's the point. I, I guess we just don't backwards. know. I'm we don't not know. Sure it feels like a big experiment. We don't know all of the risks yet. Right. And so unless there's a clear right. benefit for someone and not just for vanity to lose a couple of pounds, I would be very hesitant to recommend it. Vanity, though. Super powerful vanity. Um, last one, the conversation I don't want to have with you, even though I, you know, and, I, and I'm, despite my introduction today, I'm a self-styled expert. Um, you should know this about me if you don't. I, 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 I I, this sounds like I'm patting myself on my back, but um, Pete would describe me as thoughtful. I think I read a lot, and I, whatever it is I arrive at, you know, I've put something into it usually, even what I watch on TV. But that doesn't mean I'm exempt from addiction. So um, if I'm being authentic, and I want to be, I'm super addicted to nicotine. Um, and I know this about myself in my life. I don't think I'll ever be an alcoholic. I'm not, I do not have an addictive personality to depressants. 
Um, the stimulant that is nicotine is the most addictive thing I've ever encountered in my life. I haven't encountered everything. Um, and I think it's only become more aware to me, Dr. Sapphire, in the past year. Like, I chewed tobacco when I was a kid, like a lot of kids in Texas. And then, you know, it morphed into different products throughout. And then I quit pretty well in my 30s. You know, now I'm in my 40s, and they bring in Zen. And Zen, the nicotine pouch with no tobacco, so no link to cancer, because tobacco is what causes cancer. So, you know, and then I read all the studies. Well, nicotine actually isn't that bad for you. It's not to say it's got no problems, like increased rate of high blood pressure, maybe. Um, but it's 100% addictive, at least for me. I have tried everything. Like, I'm going to limit it today. I'm going to wait till this time today. And every day is a failure for me. And I hate it. I hate it. I hate failing. So I wake up and I say, less today, less. I just need to say cold turkey because I've learned that about myself. It's the only thing that works. But I do want to ask you this. Do you disagree with my premise of what I've read that for right now, nicotine doesn't seem like that bad of a drug to be addicted to in terms of its health detriments? Well, first of all, you're not alone in your nicotine addiction. It is wildly known as one of the most addictive chemicals possible. It's one of the hardest habits to break. What I find interesting, though, Will, is and that— On that real quick, Dr. Sapphire, like Ozempic conversation, this one's not being had— a lot, I, almost every, not every friend of mine, but a high percentage friend of mine, ranging from 20s to 50s, dudes, Zen. Like, it's a big deal. It's out there. A lot of people are doing Zen. And Zen are just the little packets, right? It's not you're inhaling it or anything of the sort, Yeah. right? Okay. So forgive my ignorance. Yeah, on it's right here. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's just, a, it's just a little pouch you put in your mouth. <laughs> so first of all, you're right in the fact that when we're talking about all the addictive sub substances, there are far worse things. Yeah, nicotine is linked to high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, maybe some heart arrhythmias. Um, however, there, it's also linked to improved cognition, and uh, especially in patients with certain dementias and Parkinsonism, and it does give you that energy boost. And so when we're talking about as we age, all of a sudden we have decreased energy and people are looking for ways to boost their energy, whether they're taking testosterone, whether they're lowering their inflammation with GLP-1 agonists, you're taking Zen. It's kind of all the same thing in that sense to me, because we're all kind of looking for something just to feel a little bit better. So you're taking it to feel a little bit better. And that is just what it is. You've already read upon the risks of it. And I'm assuming that you're monitoring your blood pressure and you see your primary care doctor. And I happen to know that you live a relatively healthy life a little bit. See, none well, of those things. I'm trying to give you the benefit of the doubt here. If you don't have any of the cardiovascular disease risk factors and stuff, I'm not going to come down hard on you. Now, when, when one of our friends was constantly vaping, I had a problem with that. And I would say something about that because I felt very strongly <laughs> about it. I would say something strongly because I'm like, this is not good. Your lungs have a very thin lining. There's going to be damage, and I, you got to stop. When you're just talking about pure nicotine, while I don't recommend anybody start it, there he are did. far worse things. And I do just truly think that as you're getting older and entering your menopause, this is probably what you're taking to help with some of your <laughs> menopause symptoms. I don't think it's helping with my sleep. And um, no, I will say uh, our friend has quit vaping. <laughs> and you're right like vaping also intuitively that doesn't look good for your lungs um but maybe sin's not so bad but i still want to quit i don't like being out of control i do, that's the main thing yeah, well, i do not like something. being not being in charge of this yeah you you are addicted to um, it and, I, you know. I guess it gives me a window it gives me a window into what I guess these people are addicted to real things, you know, opioids or whatever. Is like it's weird. Like you say, like I do it to enjoy it. No, I don't. I don't enjoy it. I I, I enjoy one of the day, the first one. After that, it's just because my body is saying, "Let's go. It's time." You know, it's not. It's not fun. Um, all right, but this conversation's been fun. The book, Love Mom. Inspiring Stories Celebrating Motherhood. It's on sale at foxnewsbooks.com. It's by Dr. Nicole Sapphire. It's a great conversation. It's a great book. And I uh, really appreciate you being on The Will Cain Show. Thanks for having me.